Fallacy of Decentralization by Nat Sakimura Common Web 3 narratives go Web 1 was decentralized Web 2 is centralized and dominated by GAF and Big Techs Web 3 will be decentralized and we will liberate the people Is that true? Actually, this narrative is full of myths and needs to be re-evaluated with facts Let us look back to Web 1.0 Web 1 started around 1991. Web 1 was about publishing web pages that were linked to other pages. The publishing sites were decentralized all over and were connected by hyperlinks. Schematics resembled spider webs. Thus, the name Web. It was followed by Web 2.0 in 2004. The API economy is a key component of Web 2.0 Allowing for the decentralization of data and services, this has enabled the development of innovative applications and services that are transforming the way we interact with the world. The main player of Web 2.0 is not a monolithic system represented by the word site, but individual functions provided as APIs. These individual functions are offered as REST APIs, and by combining these APIs, like Lego, new services can be quickly created. In a way, this was the ultimate decentralization. This is because the unit known as an application was broken down, distributed into individual functional units. At the same time, data can be fetched as needed from each API, eliminating the need for a centralized database. And when this happened, GAFA, the big techs, were not dominating the world. 2004 is the year when Facebook was born. YouTube was in 2005. AWS was in 2006. It was a time before the iPhone, which came out in 2007. Since they were just established, their revenues were still quite low. Google was still only $3.2 billion. Facebook was only $0.38 million, even smaller than my own company. Compared to it, Microsoft was $37 billion and IBM $96 billion. It is apparent who the big techs were then. From this perspective, GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon were clearly the revolutionary forces, while IBM Microsoft represented Ancien Regime. I still remember the fervor of the revolution back then, advocating power to the people. Did we realize decentralization revolution? Clearly not. We are now in the GAFAM dominated world. We may have dismantled the old regime, but what came after was the emperor as this famous painting depicts. This can also be seen in the numbers. GAFA, which once seemed to be so much on our side, have now become mega corporations that dominate the world. Indeed, the old regime represented by IBM has fallen. However, what replaced it was an even more immense power, and it wasn't the case that the power was distributed to the people. Why did we end up here? Why so much concentration despite Web 2.0 being decentralized to the extreme technically? The key is in these figures. Here, you can see Google's annual revenue is growing exponentially. The same applies to Facebook. It is showing the symptom of increasing return. Indeed, it was the combination of free market competition and technology that exhibited increasing returns that led to where we are today. Any IT technology has decreasing cost, increasing return on investment. Under the circumstances, it will end up in a winner-takes-all, monopoly, oligopoly. That's how we ended up. In other words, it was inevitable that we end up in this kind of oligopoly situation. Would Web3 make a difference? Likely not. It still is an information technology. It exhibits increasing return, and it is likely that we end up at the same place as we did in Web 2.0. Centralization. Now let us take a look at what is meant by centralized and decentralized. For this purpose, I have brought this slide titled Gradation of Decentralization. When we talk about decentralization, we need to specify what is being decentralized. 
when the subject of decentralization is distributed equally to the number of entities in the ecosystem, it is perfectly decentralized. The opposite case is when the subject is concentrated on one entity, then it is perfectly centralized. Note that it is not binary between centralized and decentralized. Usually it is in between. It is represented by the shade of grey in this figure. As an example, let us think about the decentralized ledger and traditional ledger. When there are n entities that record in a ledger, there will be n traditional ledgers. Thus, it is completely decentralized. In contrast, in the case of a distributed ledger, there is exactly one ledger. So, despite the name, it is completely centralized. What a marketing genius to name a completely centralized ledger, a distributed ledger. I should certainly learn from that. Now, let's turn to figures to further see how centralized they are. According to bitinfocards.com, 0.34% of addresses own 82.228% of Bitcoin. Dowit Wright, which is defunct now, by the way, calculated the lowest and highest Gini coefficients of DAOs, with limit swaps 0.761 being the lowest and Lido DAOs 0.93 the highest. Compare this to the real world. South Africa has the highest Gini coefficient in the world, but it is only 0.63. Centralization of the ability to drain funds is also apparent. In the case of Polygon, which uses an 8-key multi-signature for the code base, it turns out that the collusion of the four co-founders and another key holder, potentially a lawyer, is enough to drain Polygon. Crazy centralized. Now, let us look at the decentralized identity and wallets. First, we will look at the instances of IDPs. A wallet is an IDP. The number of instances will be greater than the number of devices, N, belonging to individuals. In the context of decentralized identity, this aspect seems to be called out as decentralized. On the other hand, in the wallet model, personal data get accumulated in the wallet and thus exhibit hypercentralization in this sense whereas the fetch from authoritative data source model exhibits complete decentralization. Note that not only the data, but liability also gets accumulated to individuals. This centralization of personal data is a very attractive target for attackers. Until now, they had to attack each authoritative source individually, but now they can try to drain all the data from the targeted wallet instance. This is going to be extremely efficient. Next, let us think about the number of IDPs. In Web 2.0, hundreds of thousands of IDPs exist. It is true that huge IDPs like Google and Apple draw our attention, but there are many others. For example, in the field of education, each academic institution has its own IDP, and I have my own IDP as well. Of course, this number is minuscule when compared to the world population, but it can be said to be neither completely centralized nor decentralized. What about that in the wallet model? In the wallet model, the number of wallet providers is likely to become significantly smaller than in the case of the web to idp model. Moreover, even among those wallets, all wallets are equal, but some are more equal than others. In the end, it will be centralized to the platform wallet, Apple Wallet, Google Wallet, or result in OS mediated wallet selection model, and it will be centralized to the platforms. Under such circumstances, we tend to make a policy intervention. For example, several jurisdictions are moving towards forcing certain large providers of services to accept any certified wallets, and even going as far as forcing to allow independent app stores to download these wallets. However, I am not optimistic about it. Why would a user install an independent app or app store to just use wallets while the platform supplied wallet works? It sounds pretty unlikely. Moreover, there are issues of trust. It is often said that big IDPs spy on you, but wallets will not. Is that so? 
How can you believe the code that runs on your phone does not spy on you? Big Brother may be watching you. They may say, do not worry, do not think, ignorance is power. Even in the absence of such malicious intent, it is possible, and indeed has happened. In the case of the crypto asset Solana breach, the wallet, Slope Wallet, transmitted private keys and mnemonics to an external server as part of the error message. Devil's Dictionary of Linguistic Dark Patterns, which was compiled at Internet Identity Workshop 2022, defines decentralized as we run our code on your machine at your own risk. Well, I sincerely hope that it is not going to be the case. Those wallet providers that run code on our phone has no intention of tricking us, and they are not trying to push the liability to the individuals, which was traditionally assumed by the operators of IDPs. Most stakeholders probably are going to act benevolently, but we are at the risk of precipitating to the global minimum, just like the fallacy of composition, such as the paradox of saving. In the paradox of saving, each autonomous individual tries to increase the saving. This leads to a decrease in aggregate demand, and thus a decrease in gross output, which will in turn lower total saving. If such behaviour continues, it will lead us to the global minimum, zero saving. Similarly, in the decentralised identity context, everyone may try to increase the degree of decentralization but in aggregate, we may end up with more centralization. I am calling this symptom a fallacy of decentralization. Is there no light? Can Web 3.0 help? Certainly not the Web 3 that can be found between A and Z that Jack Dorsey points out. But perhaps there is a chance that we find in Cypherpunk's idealistic dream. One of the biggest innovations of Web3 is that it commits the running code into the ledger so that it is immutable, publicly visible, and auditable. In Web2, the belief that the code that is being run is behaving correctly needs to be based on organizational trust. Web3 has the potential to move the trust anchor to the running code itself. Trust in the running code. Right now, Mainstream smart contracts seem to lack the scalability needed, but it can be a hint to the next step. Let us think together now, before it gets too late.